All right, Professor. Uh, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the Center for Global Studies for agreeing to do this brief interview. Very grateful. Uh, yeah. Uh, most of the questions are based off your book, Decolonizing the Mind. Oh, Decolonizing the Mind. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you wrote Decolonizing the Mind <coughs> about 36 years ago. Yes, about. that's, that's and, right. 1984. <laughs> wow. Actually, there were uh, originally uh, four lectures yes, that I gave at uh, Auckland University in yeah. New Zealand. Yes. Yeah. So, you basically cited a number of inspirations: the people, the uh, uh, the people who debated the lectures with you, uh, and you said that you know those were some of your inspirations for giving those lectures and for eventually writing the book. So I just wanted to know what was the main vision that you had in your mind? What was the, you know, the principal driving force behind writing this book when you did? Yeah, you know, it's, it is actually a long history. Okay. By the way, a German translation will be coming out soon. Okay. And ironically, last night I was writing the preface the, to the German, the German edition. Um, the, uh, in, in some way, we, we can argue that this, the book begins a long time ago, right. in my childhood, uh, in Kenya, which was a British settler colony, and um, and a system of education that I underwent uh, as a colonial student which basically involved um, uh, being beaten. Mm. Uh, when I spoke a coil in a school compound. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's as if the life of English was dependent on the death of the queer language, yeah. But some of those thoughts didn't, they didn't, my resentment didn't really form into a thought system until about many years later. I went to school, I went to college, literally, you know. Um, uh, I come back, I started working in the village. And so I said, in other words, I think about it, the stitch, the situation began to clarify years later, mm -hmm. you know, when I work in a village of Camerido, which I mentioned in the introduction, yeah. I'm in prison for a year mm -hmm. at a maximum security prison for doing nothing more than just, you know, write a play or help write a play in the Koyo language. And so I can argue that in terms of formal beginnings, of serious conceptualization about uh, not only writing a code but thinking in a systematic way the whole issue of language. You know, uh, I began this really truly at uh, committee maximum security prison mm -hmm. in 1978. So by the time I could write, I write a lecture in 1984, it was as if I had written or I've written various versions of it uh, in my different talks, <coughs> my interviews, and so on. So, the colon like the mind, become, the lectures become almost like a summary of a process of thinking mm -hmm. which had been undergoing for many years. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And that kind of connects to the next question because you talked about how, you know, you were beaten for voicing your opinion in your own language. And in the book you write that uh, the bullet was the means of physical subjugation, while language was the means of spiritual subjugation. So I just want to get, you know, how do you see an African now who, who, who has managed to transcend this kind of spiritual subjugation, you know, and how does he or she interact with this globalized world, you know, how does the person uh, write, speak. Yeah, yeah it's a bit like, it has been a collective breakthrough. Okay. Yeah. 
it, it cannot simply be an individual. Mm. Uh, you can try individually, like I tried writing the Koyo language, you know, mm -hmm. but until government policies change, until the whole, you know, um, mental universe and which we operate, say, in the continent, you know, changes vis-a-vis -vis our languages, and uh, vis-a-vis, uh, say, European languages, you know, uh, it's really uh, very difficult to afford just, you know, one person. Uh, we can just try. But you can see the consequences. I think in my talks I mentioned this, that each, the, the, the theorist of, say, European language mm -hmm. as means of education, as the primary means of education, and so on, um, were very clear as to what they wanted. They wanted to create, you know, psychological chains to the metropolis. And we have seen the consequence of that today in Africa. I think I mentioned the case of 14. African countries who 50 years after independence have the tre their national treasure collectively being controlled by the Minister of Finance in Paris. Right? It's, that in itself should, it should be a wake up call. Right? Right? It's, a country which is smaller than probably any of those countries, mm. right? They can, 50 years, not the first year, but 50 years of the independence, kind of money, their own money, mm. without the approval of France. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is a very valid point. And, you know, in continuing this discussion about policy, you know, I went to research some of the policies that African countries have been making towards promoting their own languages within curricula, because that's also something that you've been outspoken about. And I found that, you know, um, the former, or now late, Vice President of the AU's Economic, Social, and Cultural Council, he mentioned that the use of African languages in education has followed both a positive trend in the formulation of clear policies at the national level and a negative trend in the sense of a lack of actual implementation. And one of the reasons that was widely mentioned in a lot of the literature I read was a lack of deep-seated commitment to implementation amongst the elite and yes. policymakers. Yeah. So what do you think it's we the policy. Can do? Actually, that's a, that's a good summary of the situation in a sense that at the OEU, even in some cases, in some cases, some leadership who pay lip service to mm -hmm. African languages. Those, oh, we must be proud of our languages. Mm -hmm. Oh, we must be, huh? it's good to have our own languages. And some of them will speak one or two words, you know, in rallies and so on, and particularly if they make uh, jokes mm -hmm. or insulting words. Mm -hmm. They will use their language sometimes, you know. But in terms of but it's something which needs drastic, you know, measures, you know, commitment, training teachers, you know, putting resources, the school system, you know, uh, uh, making the knowledge of African languages matter in the marketplace, in the administration, mm -hmm. in the, the day to day, you know, operations, you know, uh, of that society, you know. And I do know that in Africa, in one African country, has many African languages. That's true. But all that, what that means is that there are many communities who make up that nation. And you cannot wish away those communities simply because, you know, uh, where well, there are too many. All you can do is meet a challenge. Okay, we have this many communities, we have this many languages, you know. How do we meet a challenge of communication across? So there was, that's why in Africa, in other places, you have, in, you may have to have, at, at the minimum, a two-language policy. In some cases, a three-language policy, and it can be done. By this, I mean, you know, each child in school system or whatever should know their mother tongue.
or the language or their culture. In addition, they should know, of course, whatever is the language that allows all the communication across uh, the multinational community as a whole. And that language could be French or English and so on. Then you're using it as, ne as necessity, you're using it as a means. You're using the language instead of that. You're using the borrowed language instead of that language using you, right? Okay. This is what we need, but it's, it will be concerted effort. In the case of East Africa, I advocate a three language policy, you know, a mother tongue, right, for every child, a lingua franca for every child, and uh, then in our case, say English for communicate across, you know. Uh, but for that to work, mm. the, the African language must be given value in a school, in a marketplace, in administration, and it should matter in the promotion, say, of civil servants and so on and so forth. All right, so for my final question, I just wanted to talk about some of the trends in contemporary African writing. So there's a Kenyan writer who goes by the name of Binya Vanga Wainana, right. and uh, he makes a point that popular fiction uh. has a higher trajectory in terms of like readership and sales uh. than so-called highbrow fiction. And interestingly, some of the novels cited for the former are like Jungle Gyms, Pulp Fiction magazines, uh. Mukoma, Wagugi's Nairobi novels, uh. and uh, for the latter, books by Chimamanda Adichie and Teju Cole, for example. You know, she says, what will build industries is having thousands and thousands of romance novels, of kids' fantasy books, transporting our children away, getting them hooked on these things like Nollywood. Do you think this uh, trend shares the same spirit that you were uh, trying to, you know, channel in decolonizing yeah. the mind? Because what is, is well, I, I mean, I would broadly speaking agree with that, but can this, now here is a contradiction. Okay. Because he is saying, popular fiction in English mm. for our kids, mm. no load in English. Now, of course, he's already accepted the statement, good and relevant as it is, right, within its own limits, correct. Mm. But if you question the premises mm. <laughs> or the question, you can actually see in some ways it articulates the very problem we are having, mm. right? That popular fiction should be there in African languages, mm. right? So I advocate, okay, let's have popular fiction. Let's have video fiction for children. Let's have a fiction for young people. Let's do everything. Let's flood the whole continent <laughs> with books mm. that are accessible, right? But let's be accessible in the languages of the communities, right? Okay. So what do you think about translations, maybe writing different Translations books? is very important. In fact, it's one of the things I'm really advocating as a component of the three or four language policies we can have. And translation, in fact, can help us build our nations, even our national spirit. In a sense that, say you have uh, a multi nation which as I, of course, different language uh, communities, okay? Now, that means a very good fiction, like the one Wainaina mm -hmm. is advocating, mm -hmm. says written in one African language. Yeah. Very, very, very popular, hot boiler, you know, so, you know mm -hmm. characters, you know, wonderful, okay? Say, written in Europe, for instance, in the case of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. That same fiction is translated into, say, evil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same fervor, the same hot boilerness will also be there, mm -hmm. right? It means an evil child reader will 
be identifying with the adventures, you know, of characters who are Yoruba in a fairly Yoruba environment. Mm -hmm. So imagine the same text being translated into all the Nigerian languages. So those children in the different languages will be sharing the world of that characters, that universe become a common universe. And the same would happen if another hot boy was written in say Igbo or Hausa, then translated into all the Nigerian languages. Then it means what's written in the different African languages in the same nation can become a shared experience. So instead of our languages becoming like, you know, sort of seen as being uh, separating, they can also be used to actually have a unified and unifying cultural and literally, you know, base. Okay. Thank you. And I think on that positive note, I would like to thank you for doing this interview with me on behalf of the CGS. Uh, thank you for your time.